So, well, thank you very much well, to the organizers for putting together such a nice meeting. Um, uh, and for giving me a, ch a chance to talk to talk here. Um, well, I've been hearing lots of things about qualia, beginning with qualia don't exist, or they exist but they are physical, or they are not physical, they are emergent, they are not emergent. Whatever they are, um, qualia are by definition, because they are our experience, they are observable. So if you want to learn about qualia, one possible path is to really observe them very carefully. You could become a skillful meditator, whatever, but just look at them carefully. By doing that, one can detect some mathematical patterns and build a mathematical model. And after that, then one can try to compare that mathematical model to structures arising in physics and see if they match. So the purpose of this talk is to give a toy example of such a program using very simple principles. So it, this is a really limited thing, but, and it's work in progress. So I'll, I'll welcome any, any comments. So I'll start with uh, qualia as I, well, I think the first mention of the word qualia is in, uh, in Lewis's work. He was a logician and philosopher, and he called qualia not exactly the instances of experience, but the qualities that define those instances, so that one can repeat qualia. So I could have the same experience over and over again. Um, so as a mathematician, I will start by saying the usual thing, which is qualia uh, that form a set. Now, by this, I don't mean my qualia or anybody's specific qualia. I just mean all the qualia. Every instance of experience out there in the universe is in this set. Then if it's grouped into individual portions like people, etc., that's another, another story. But uh, I won't assume any, any observers or anything to start with. The first bit of structure that I'll put here is concerned with this uh, so-called principle one, which states that the experience of consecutive experiences exists. If I see a flash of light twice, suddenly I realize, oh, well, there were two of these. That's, that's a quail itself. So I, I'll take that this set has a multiplication that has A times B being the experience of A followed by B, realized as a singular qualia, singular quail. So of course, this is in general non-commutative non and non-item potent. All this requires is a minimum of cognitive ability, like some memory. We have it, animals have it, maybe plants have it. So um, it might not be like a fundamental structure in the universe, but at least it encompasses a wide range of beings. So it's just not applied to humans. It also conveys a notion of very primitive subjective time. You have an idea that something precedes something else. I always remember a story my brother told me. He had surgery, and uh, he was under anesthesia. And uh, they told him to count backwards from 10 to 0. And his experience was that he counted 10, 9, 8, and then immediately somebody said, wake up. So after 8, his experience was wake up. There was no subjective time between those two things. I think presumably because he wasn't conscious. There were no qualia. So this suggests that somehow the density of occurrence of qualia is our inner notion of time. At least, it allows me to say that, mathematically, I want my multiplication to be associative. There's no reason to group qualia together if the only thing that happens after B... What? Where is this? Okay. After B is C. It doesn't matter that C happened two million years afterwards. This is the next thing. It's just immediately after. Now I'll add a little bit more structure. I don't want everything really to be composable. I don't think that Alice's coil A can be composed in a meaningful way with Bob's quail B, because there's no underlying common neurological mechanism to register this aha composition moment. So instead of uh, using a partial multiplication, as you would do in category theory, I'll add this zero, which is the impossible quail. It's, it's just there for mathematical purposes. And I say that A cannot be composed with B if AB equals zero. So mathematically, this is a, a now a semigroup with zero satisfying the absorption law. So what's the next step? Now you bring in logic. And I'll base this again on Lewis's notion of a pure concept, which is, uh, according to him, that uh, meaning which um, is common to two minds when they're able to basically talk to each other. That's the communication part, not the qualia part. Um, well, um, I'll assume that qualia are actually quite concrete and physical things. 
because they are about information, and information is physical, such as information stored in brain synapses. So how do these concepts form? As, you, as you're exposed to new experiences, you're, well, your synapses get change, so uh, the concepts will get stored in your brain. And uh, so the next principle says that each concept is formed in response to a finite number of qualia using finite resources, such as finite energy, because, well, there's no, no infinite number of experiences or anything. So this is the only limitation, that's finiteness. Well, uh, in order to represent qualia in this model, I don't want to carry brains or wetware around, so I'll just do it very abstractly. I'll identify concepts with subsets of Q. So each concept is identified with a collection of all the qualia that trigger that concept, that, that, uh, that concept recognizes as belonging to it. For instance, Alice's concept red will correspond to all the qualia of redness for Alice, like seeing a beautiful sunset or seeing that Bob is blushing. And, um, and if they communicate, Alice and Bob can agree that they're talking about basically the same thing. So they realize there is a common concept. And this common concept is then the union of their concepts of red. So it's, again, another set. So does any set qualify to be a concept? Well, no. You have this finiteness assumption. The finiteness assumption places restrictions. The way I model it is to consider that the concepts are open sets of a topology. Why is that? Well, if something is in the open set, then it's interior to it. So intuitively, I, I know that if I look close enough, I know that the, the, the coil is inside the concept. Whereas if the coil is not in the concept, it could be a boundary point. Being a boundary point makes it really close to the set and really close to the exterior. So if you look, imagine you're measuring your height with a ruler and something is really on the boundary, no matter how close you look, you'll never be able to tell if it's above or below the boundary. So it's, it's undecidable. You cannot decide it in finite time. This also caters for a notion of uncertainty, but you don't need fuzzy sets or multivalued logic or something like that. It's a trick that's also used in computer science when people uh, model uh, semantics of programming languages by saying that you have a the states of a program and the open sets are semi-decidable properties. Okay, so what I said so far suggests that qualia exist independently of concepts. There's a sea of qualia out there and then there are the concepts. Well, this is, I, I started this for practical purposes, but I don't really buy this. Uh, so the thing is, imagine you have a human baby who opens his eyes for the first time. I'm not sure what I'm going to say is really accurate for human babies, but for the sake of the argument, let's pretend it is. So he opens his eyes for the first time, he sees light. He doesn't care or doesn't notice that it's red or blue or anything, just light. Then as he gets more and more repeatedly exposed to light, he'll start distinguishing red and blue. That means his, his synapses are changing. So the concepts of red and blue are being recorded. And after they are recorded, then the activation of these structures is going to give him the experience of red and blue. So he only gets the experiences once the concepts are there. So neither the qualia nor the concepts precede each other. So I call this principle three, saying that qualia cannot arise except in relation to concepts. It's, they sort of arise hand in hand. It's like two facets of reality. The qualia being the mental aspect and the, the concepts being the physical aspect. But they're not separate. It's, this reminds me of a notion in philosophy that I, I don't know very much about it, but it's called to uh, dual aspect monism, so we've got two facets of reality. Well, mathematically, this implies that key, Q should be a T0 space. If you have two qualia which belong to exactly the same concepts, well, then there's no sense in saying that they are different experiences, they should be the same. Another aspect of this is that the topology of any space is what one calls a locale. That's a complete lattice satisfying a, well, a simple distributivity property. That can be regarded as a model of a propositional logic called geometric logic, whose logic connectives are finite conjunctions and arbitrary disjunctions. So it's, there's an asymmetry there. Now, the basic models, elementary models of this logic are the valuations which map uh, the topology into the topology of a singleton, which consists of two truth values. And they can be regarded as the logically derived points. According to the logic, these are the points that should exist. In fact, if you have each po a point, an actual point of Q, so a quail, there will be a corresponding valuation that assigns 
to each concept the value true precisely when it is true that the coil belongs to the concept. Fine. Okay, now let's suppose that the logic allows you to, to discover that some valuation exists which does not arise like this. Then that means that your system of concepts enables you to infer the existence of an experience which does not exist. This is slightly irrational, so I want to exclude this. I want my system of concepts to be reliable. So the, uh, the, second, the, the other, next principle is a strengthening of the previous one, saying that qualia can arise in response to concepts whenever uh, this is logically expected. So in practice, I want there to be a bijection between qualia and evaluations. And the spaces satisfying this condition are called the sober spaces. And mathematicians are funny people. Sober uh, actually means non-irrational in, in a certain sense. OK, um, what are the implications of this mathematically? Well, any topological space has a specialization order, which is defined up there. Um, for a sober space, this is a complete DCPO. That means that every directed, upwards directed set has a supremum or a join. Of course, we should assume that the multiplication should be continuous, and that will give you these distributivity conditions. Multiplication preserves these directed joins in each variable separately. There's another join which I added in the beginning, which is the impossible quail. If you take that to be the least element, so the join of the empty set, then these distributivity conditions give you precisely the absorption loss. So what's missing in order to have all the suprema? That's only the binary joins. If you have those, then you have everything. So if they exist, and if multiplication preserves them, then you get a structure that is called a quantal. Um, the name was motivated because it was supposed to have something with quantum mechanics, but I won't go into that. Um, so it's a complete lattice with a semi-group structure whose multiplication preserves joins in each variable separately. Let's look again at these binary joins. I just don't want to throw them in as a mathematical thing without telling you a little about that. Suppose you have two qualia, red and bright. I mean, the experience of seeing red light or bright light. And above that, the join is, well, the experience of bright red. That's easy to understand. That's the same kind of thing people would do in computer science when having states of a program and then properties of, of these states. However, here, it doesn't really work that way because now you have concepts which contradict each other, like this one. I have red light and blue light. It doesn't make a lot of sense to have an experience of blue-red. Although, it, would, might, it might make sense to have an experience of light which wasn't sharp enough for you to tell if it was red or blue. And if you look more carefully, you can realize it was red or actually blue. It could even be worse. It could be that the thing you're looking at is neither red nor blue. And it will turn that way once you look at it, like in a quantum superposition. So you can do this. Uh, this model that I'm constructing allows you to talk about qualia that arise when you look at a quantum system. Suppose you have a little Schrodinger cat box. But for ethical reasons, I don't put a, a cat inside. I put a, a stern gerlach apparat apparatus. I know that uh, the, the orientation of the magnetic field. So I know that an electron will come in, and the spin will be measured along z. But and, and so this noticing is that it has been measured is this quail here. But until I open the box, the system cannot be said to be in this state or in that state. So all this said, what, I'll take these binary joints to be so-called logical superpositions. They're like quantum superpositions without numbers. So there's not a, a, a numbers saying how much uh, quail belongs to superposition. It's either there or not. The prototypical model for this is uh, we take a C-star algebra. For people who don't know what a C-star algebra is, it's a ring with a topology with very good properties. Then take all the closed linear subspaces of the algebra uh, and extend the multiplication in the algebra in the natural way. And that gives you a quantile. Also, it is a sober space when you put in the lower Vitoris topology, which is weaker than the Scott topology. And uh, so this satisfies all the properties that I, that I presented uh, uh, before and a bunch of others which are very useful but I don't have to, time to discuss. In, this, in the spin case, the algebra would be the 2 by 2 matrices. And you get a lot of stuff inside. For instance, you have this little Boolean algebra containing the qualia for z minus z plus and their join. 
Same thing for x and for any other direction you conceive. And of course, you can represent this by five minutes, yeah. You can represent this by spaces, which are spanned by projection matrices, as you would expect. But also, uh, you can take this quantile to be something else. You can take it as a language of quantum measurements, where you can think of, oops, sorry, you can think of uh, z minus uh, here as a state preparation, z plus as measurement result, and this partial isometry is something that carries z minus to z plus. It doesn't matter how you did it, but it's just a kinematical description of a measurement. You can do this because, well, you, you have lots of projections in this algebra because it's a phonomen algebra. In general, for a C star algebra, you don't have projections, enough projections or partial isometries, and you have to resort to something else. What you do is you take a billion subalgebras, take their ideal lattices, which are locales, that's in max A. So locales, remember, are these propositional logics. Also, you have canonical representations of transformations which are like partial isometries going from open sets of the spectrum of the algebra to other open sets. So you get a kind of logic with a rich system of symmetries. So I'll skip some details and there's, I can argue that this qualia quantile should have similar properties and so it, it will have many embedded pseudogroups, these systems of symmetries. The sets of idempotents of pseudogroups are locales. So if you stick to such a locale, remember these are qualia, then the composition is idempotent and it's commutative. It's just to meet in a lattice. So if you are stubborn and stick to this collection of qualia, you'll get a very stable illusion about the world. Things are really stable. Your brain might even develop a, a notion, a mental model, that there is a space with points and open sets. Whereas, in fact, the only thing you see when you look at something is the open sets. This reminds me of the last part of William Marshall's talk yesterday. The information you get from looking at this wall is just something about portions of the wall. You never see points. So these pseudogroups are, in a sense, observers. They are snapshots at, at the world, and they have their own system of symmetries. In quantum mechanics, this would be, uh, well, a classical observer. Now, there's canonical ways to compare different observers, there are mappings between them, which topologically means that the points of, of a locale get mapped to closed sets of points of another locale. It's like a, a change of basis when you have different bases of a linear space. A basis vector is a linear combination of other basis vectors. Here, again, the linear combination is just a zero, has coefficients zero and one. So, each state of observable one corresponds to a set of states of the complementary observable two, not a measure supported on that set as you would have in quantum mechanics. So metaphorically, you can think of Q as a kind of measure-free quantum mechanics. It's just a topological part. Then you had to add the numbers if you want to do quantum mechanics. So in conclusion, what this Q is, is an attempt, a toy model, to describe a space of qualia from very simple principles without needing observers. So it's a realist time model of consciousness. Whether or not it's realistic, it's a different story, but you can tell me your opinions about this. The main ingredients were a concept topology and a multiplication that caters for a subjective time. And then a lot of structure, observers, selves, spatial structures, they emerge from the structure of Q. There's also intersubjectivity. Uh, well, there are canonical mappings from arbitrary qualia to the qualia of specific observers and from the concepts to the qualia of specific observers. And you can think of this in topology as a kind of uh, expectation. Uh, so it's the way you perceive things in the world when you're sticking to a particular observer. It's, well, it's a well-known thing in psychology that your expectations affect your perceptions. And ultimately, uh, for a physical system, which is described by a C-star algebra, well, this quantile max A is, I didn't delve into this, but you can think of it as a language for describing quantum measurements, but also as a language for describing qualia. So coming from a different direction and without ever mentioning the word collapse until now, this suggests that there's some analogy between measurements and qualia. And, and that's it. Well, thanks very much for your attention.